it out. I'm Alvina, and uh, I'm kind of new to airline, so I consider myself uh, like the simplest organism on the evolutionary ladder of um, of, uh, of uh, speakers here. Um, nonetheless, I'll be talking about a really cool subject: um, uh, maximizing throughputs on multi-core systems with airline. Um, Uh, so what, I, what I'll be focusing on is um, uh, the recent project I was working on at uh, Ubiquiti Networks, uh, this <laughs> wonderful company that um, actually pays me money to code in Erlang, my favorite language. It's the language I uh, fell in love with at first sight. I didn't want to understand why. Actually, now I understand, but it's been, uh, at, uh, at that time I didn't. But it just was the language I wanted to code in, but somehow I... Uh, kept coding in Java. Uh, I don't know why. Um, so this is uh, the project. Uh, what uh, I was working on is um, RESTful HTTP server handling um, audio configurations. So let's say we have these audio devices and um, we, have, uh, we get audio configurations uh, for these devices, like um, audio greetings. So it's pretty simple. We have a text. We have, um, and we have uh, output formats, uh, audio output formats you want to convert it to. So our HTTP server gets this request, um, gets this configuration. It's a RESTful HTTP server. It does the usual uh, RESTful stuff, uh, add update, delete, fetch. We are not going to talk about that right now. We're going to talk about the fun, thing that, the fun things that this server does, um, audio conversions. So uh, we take the text, convert it to a voice, and the resulting wave file will be converted to the other format. So we have all these audio files, and we are going to send them over to Amazon uh, Simple Storage Service, known as S3. And as the, um, as the S3 request complete, we save the uh, S3 URLs to our database. These yellow thingies are the S3 URLs. They come in one at a time. So um, a couple of concerns. Uh, audio conversions are very CPU intensive. Um, saves to S3, on the other hand, are easy on the CPU, uh, but might take an unpredictably long time to complete. So um, we are going to be handling our audio request asynchronously. We'll reply to the client with something. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll validate the request, and the reply was acknowledgement that we are processing it. Uh, and now on to the fun part. Um, our approach to this problem in Erlang. Uh, so first, um, in order to process the, uh, um, the audio request audio update or add requests asynchronously, uh, our HTTP handler will create a finite state machine for every single uh, add update request. So we get a request, we, create, uh, we spawn a finite state machine, <laughs> and it's going to uh, handle it, and it's going to take some time. And we got another request, and we have another, we spawn another uh, finite state machine. And we have another request, and we spawn another finite state machine. Uh, if you're tired of me saying this over and over again, just imagine how tired our HTTP server is of spawning those things. <laughs> um, and in Erlang, it's perfectly OK to spawn hundreds, thousands of processes like that. And it's, there is, you don't have to worry about it as, a, as an Erlang developer. You don't have to worry about it. Erlang VM will take uh, care of mapping these processes out to underlying OS threads. Sorry, there's a lot of them. Much less than uh, in real life. So um, that's because Erlang processes are cheap. Um, actually, I looked it up 327 words on spawn, including a heap of 233 words, if that tells you anything. Um, so next, um, audio conversions. Luckily, this is not a novel problem, so we just used existing um, C executables to do audio conversions. 
So for text to voice conversions, we use substral service. And for converting the resulting WAV file to the other formats, we used um, SOX. However, if you need to write your own uh, CPU intensive task, uh, especially if it's a, uh, some kind of a number crunchy computational kind of task um, that will be manipulating a large data structure that, that needs to manipulate large data structures, it is probably a good idea to write it in C or other language that, um, that actually has, has mutable data structures. Because um, that's the one thing that Erlang will be kind of slow with. Well, its immutability is what makes it great for concurrency, right? So uh, keep that in mind. And we can, uh, so what we need to do is, uh, for those uh, very CPU intensive computational tasks, we're probably better off creating a single, uh, a single threaded unit of work in C and um, let Erlang manage the concurrency of it. And I would like to quote um, our very famous Garrett Smith. Uh, think of our Lang as a manager, not a worker. <laughs> uh, next problem we had was uh, saves to S3. Uh, uh, those, as I mentioned, um, might take a very long time. So we are the FSM. Um, we create the S3 URL. It looks something like this. And we already have converted our text to... Um, we have converted our text to um, audio, so we have our audio binary. Hi, it's Tim. Call me back. You heard that? Yes. Um, so we have uh, all this information. We are ready to send it to S3. Now, if we are this busy FSM, we are going to send it to S3 and just sit there waiting for the reply, and it might take forever. And we need to do other things. We have to do all the audio conversions. We have to perform. Uh, we have to set. Uh, send uh, the other uh, uh, S3 requests. We also need to save the resulting, uh, res uh, the results of the S3 request to the database. So we have plenty to do and just sending an S3 request and sitting there waiting for it would be sort of inefficient. Um, so as an Erlang develop uh, like uh, as an Erlang developer, naturally all you do is just spawn another process uh, to take care of it. And this is how we do it. This is the code to spawn another process, a process in our line. So we spawn a child process that's going to be executing our send uh, S3 request. And once it's done, it's going to be doing nothing but sitting there waiting for, <laughs> sitting there waiting for the result. Also, we uh, supply this process with the uh, process ID to our, uh, uh, with our own process ID, so we can get notified of the result uh, when the uh, request completes. And this is. Um, this is our uh, child process code. So it sends the S3 request. And then once it's done, <coughs> it might take five minutes or 10, whatever, I don't know. Um, it sends the request back to us and ceases to exist. Uh, now, uh, back to our audio <coughs> conversions. Actually, I wanted to say something else. I was just going to point out that, um, I just wanted to point out that now we have all these FSM processes that we spawned in our HTTP server for like every uh, for every audio's update request, and um, now it, within the FSM we also spawn another we spawn a whole bunch of other child processes based on how many uh, output uh, <coughs> formats we have, and so we just spawn processes all we want. That's totally okay to do it in Erlang, um, but those are not uh, very CPU intensive processes. They are just like more like managing, managing, controlling kind of processes. Now let's uh, look at our audio conversions. Uh, those, as we mentioned, are CPU intensive, and we have to be careful with those. Uh, how do we? So we, our HTTP server will be getting multiple um, audio requests, and we are bound to be in a situation when multiple audio conversions will be running. So how do we make sure? That, let's say my computer has eight CPUs, how do we make sure that all eight CPUs are not eaten up by those audio conversions? And we still have uh, a little bit of resources left for those important HTTP requests, saves to the database. Uh, how do we not end up in a situation when audio conversions eat up uh, all our CPU and we get a situation commonly known as overload? 
Well, very easy answer. What we can do is limit simultaneous uh, jobs to number of CPUs minus one, and we leave one uh, for uh, other important work. Um, so, uh, how, so how are we gonna do it? We can, this seems like a super easy problem. Just keep some counter of how many jobs are running, and um, so we can certainly roll our own code to do it. In fact, roll your own anything is a very tempting choice for an airline developer, be, developer because um, accomplishing anything in Erlang takes maybe five, maybe 10 times less resources than in most other languages. So roll your own anything, that's what Erlang developers like to do. Uh, but we, uh, we are very, like we are really busy with our actual business requirements and we have very tight deadlines. So we think about maybe using an existing library um, and considering that, yes, that's what we did. We uh, decided to look for existing libraries to handle this very simple problem for us. And the library we chose is um, the Jobs Framework by Ulf Pieker. <laughs> um, so uh, the rest of the presentation, I will be uh, talking about this framework, but I want you to understand that I'm not trying to sell it to you, or I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not trying to uh, make your, uh, I'm not trying to get, this is not a tutorial on Jobs Framework, basically. I actually don't know what, uh, I maybe know 10% or maybe 90% of it, I don't know. Um, but I think it's, an, it's a really great example. Um, so what, what the Jobs uh, Library is, uh, per Ulf, it's a job scheduler for load regulation. And uh, to make it even simpler, its sole purpose in life is to prevent overload. Overload uh, by this article, it, uh, according to this article by Ulf, written in 2010, and this article actually is uh, pretty much describes the inspiration behind the jobs framework. It's the leading cause of system downtime. And let's take a closer look at this diagram. So it, it shows uh, failures in the US public switch telephony network outage minutes by cause. Obviously, we see that overload is the main cause for failures. So I really hope that this, um, uh, that this uh, diagram is scientific proof enough for you to be aware of over overload and consider preventing it before your code goes into production. Um, so now uh, on to how we use the, the jobs framework to deal with our audio conversions uh, problem. Um, so one of the great goods that job framework offers is um, counter-based regulation. So what it does, it uh, only lets up to seven jobs execute simultaneously. Anything else gets queued up, up to a number of jobs, I meant to say. I use seven because there is eight CPUs in my uh, machine here. So I hope you got the idea. What I just demonstrated was uh, counter-based regulation with a FIFO queue. Job framework actually offers different queue implementations, FIFO queue, uh, LIFO queue, um, producer, uh, accept, reject. It also provides, which is the coolest thing, is the jobs, uh, jobs queue behavior. So you can implement your own queue if you don't like what job framework provides. Um, and now, um, Please take a deep breath. I would like to uh, dive into some code and walk you through the entire process of setting counter-based regulation with our application. Step one, we pull jobs out of uh, GitHub into our rebar config apps like this. That's very important. Um, step two, uh, we set up jobs environment in our application configuration file. That's even more important. So what I did here, I created audio conversions queue, and I assigned counter-based regula regulator to it with a limit of seven. All right, I hope it wasn't too, um, too uh, complicated. And uh, fi like the final step, uh, I'm gonna, um, you'll have a chance to take a peek at our very complicated uh, business logic we do at, at Ubiquity Networks. This is our control flow. And this is a, just a teeny tiny part of it. Um, 
And anywhere within this complicated business logic, we just add this line of code to wrap our um, TPU intensive work in a call to job server. That's it. And now let me show you some of my code, which I'm really proud of. Um, some real realistic scenario. There might be some discrepancies in names too. So this is my code and I'm doing all this complicated audio conversion, say it sends to S3, whatever. Um, and this is the actual code that will be doing text to voice conversion. So that's to make, uh, so I wrap it in a call to job server and, and uh, that's it, my job, uh, my audio conversion job is regulated. Now you might be thinking, okay, she makes it sound kind of easy, but she's been talking about this job server all the time. So I need to start a job, like a, a server was my application. That doesn't sound easy. Well, it is. Uh, the last and final step is you need to add jobs to the list of your, um, to the, uh, to your application startup list. And now you have the job server running. So you also might be asking, okay, I need to start uh, uh, this job server. Don't I need to talk to my boss or to the ops team boss and ask them if that's okay to do? The, the answer is no. As an Erlang developer, you can start whatever servers you want with your application. No need to talk to anyone about it. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> that's uh, uh, thanks to Erlang process isolation, which is a really awesome topic. I would like to talk about it, but, but it's not the topic I'm supposed to talk about right now. So um, just, just believe me, it's something to look at. It's really awesome. Um, um, don't remember what the next slide's going to be. Oh, I would like to um, also show, I wanted to show you um, another great feature that um, Job Framework has to offer. And in order to get you to understand it uh, kind of quickly and painlessly, let's uh, look at this very short video. So let's pretend that these two lovely ladies are our HTTP server and the chocolates coming in on the conveyor belt are our HTTP requests. So while the requests are coming in at a pace that our server can handle, the server is very happy. <laughs> but let's see what starts happening when the requests are starting to, to come in at a much faster pace. Okay, and you think it's funny, but just remember, this is our HTTP server, and it's quite possible that this is our HTTP server in the middle of the night. Okay, so to deal with this kind of situation, Job Framework has um, rate-based regulation. And... Um, That gives you an idea what it is, hopefully. Um, Rate-based regulation, what it does is given a frequency F, it ensures that the rate of accepted job does not exceed F. And uh, here is how we set it up. Sorry, I have to show you some more code. We create a queue called HTTP request. This is still configuration. This is not even really code. This is, our uh, this is still our configuration. We create this queue called HTTP request and we assign a rate regulator to it. And you give it a limit of a thousand, a thousand per second. So that's going to be a thousand. No, it's no more than a thousand requests per second. Um, and this number I just pulled out of thin air. In order to come up with a good number, you really need to do some load testing of your HTTP server or whatever application you uh, need to rate regulate. And then you can come up with a good number. If you uh, if you load testing your application and at some point it starts failing and doing things the unexpected things. That's, that's going to be the number you're going to put uh, here. Okay, that's not a thousand, just a number. You, ha you have to come up with your own number. Um, uh, next, what was next? Okay, now um, what ifs? I, after looking at those two awesome features, I personally had a whole lot of what ifs creeping in. So let's look at some of these uh, what ifs. Uh, what if uh, we get a denial of service attack? What's the big deal? We have our HTTP server uh, rate regulated. So we're going to have uh, the requests coming in at a, 
um, maximal pace of whatever and we have no problem, right? We are good. Um, the only thing, remember those HTTP requests queue? It's inflating. And eventually, what it's going to do is going to blow up our, your server's memory. All right, how do we deal with this problem? We limit the queue size. Uh, luckily, Jobs, uh, uh, Jobs library lets us do it very easily. So we just add max size to our queue. Oh, sorry. That's how we do it. Hopefully, uh, you got it. Not too complicated. Now, uh, another what if. What if our requests have a strict timeout? Uh, for instance, if you're real-time bidding, uh, depending on your RTV provider, you'll have maybe like between 40 to 200 milliseconds to uh, serve your advertisement. Um, on the other hand, what if you're processing like a payment request? We don't want a timeout at all. Uh, we can maybe wait 10 minutes, just want to make sure it completes. But probably after 10 minutes, it's a little too long. So even a, a very, like even a request we don't want to time out should time out at some point. Um, so to uh, time out requests in the queue, what we can do is limit the request wait time in the queue. And this is how we do it. So for our RTP request, we'll set the max time to 200 milliseconds. And we'll create a queue called payment request and we'll set max time of that one to 10 minutes. And now you might be asking, okay, so now we had to split up our HTTP request into two different queues, into dif two different types of requests. What if I still want my HTTP request coming in at a certain maximum pace? How do we do that? So for that, uh, Jobs offers a third type of regulation, which is um, very similar to um, rate regulation. It's called um, uh, group rate regulation. So basically, it's it's very it's pretty much the same as rate uh, as uh, rate regulation, but it lets you put a cap on how many requests per second um, are coming in from a group of queues. Um, so here's how we set it up. We create group rates um, entity in the jobs uh, configuration. We call it HTTP request rate. We limit it to 1,000 per second. That's this magic number I came up with uh, previous, previously. And then we assign this uh, group rate regulator to our RTB requests and to our payment requests. Hope, hope it makes sense. Next, um, audio conversions, like haven't talked about them in a, quite a while now. I kind of miss those. Uh, what if uh, number of CPUs is no longer good enough? Let's say some admin start to clean up shell script uh, on our machine we are not aware of, and all of a sudden uh, we assume that we'll always have this extra one CPU available for our HTTP request, but not anymore. So for half an hour, our HTTP requests are just dropping on the floor. Uh, how do we deal with this problem. Now, the answer to that one is not going to be as simple, but it's going to be mu much more fun. So job library com jobs library comes with a sampler framework. That's a really cool and fun concept, uh, in my opinion. So what the sampler framework um, does, it sends feedback to the job server about uh, CPU, about memory, about anything you want. And, um, this is how it works. It basically comes up with a load factor, and we can sum load factors from local and optionally uh, a bunch of remote machines. And uh, this will be the percentage by, by which the predefined regulator limits will be reduced. Also, as a side note, um, uh, with the um, remote machines, we can either average them or take the maximum value. And I think that this whole thing uh, with, low, uh, with remote nodes is pretty cool. We can use it like in case we want to figure out what the overload uh, might be on uh, databases, um, or maybe even come up with your own um, load balancer. But this is not what I was going to. I was just kind of going to limit uh, my talk to uh, one machine. So uh, let's move on. 
this is how we set up um, samplers to be sending feedback to um, our job server. So we add a samplers entity to our jobs configuration. We call uh, we create a sampler called CPU, and it's going to be using job sampler CPU module that actually comes with jobs framework. And then uh, we act, we add a modifier called CPU to our regulator. So now what happens is when the CPU uh, sampler re returns some like load factor of 20, we will, this will be 20% for us that by which the uh, regulator limit should be reduced. So now <coughs> for a short amount of time, uh, the, uh, the regulator limit is going to become 800 instead of 1,000. And if the load factor goes back to zero, uh, the limit is going to go back to 1,000 and so on. It's going gonna, it's gonna to actually fluctuate and rea react to the real CPU situation on our machine. So that, I think, is pretty cool. That's a pretty cool concept. Uh, now, um, a side note about this job sampler CPU. It's great, but it uses OSMON, which is the OS monitoring application that comes with your Erlang installation. It uses CPU SAP. There is a description of what it is. Like this. Well, it's great. It works perfect uh, for uh, feedback from CPU, except for it only works on Unix or Linux OS. So now if you want to, uh, if you want to run your um, application on a Mac, like I have a Mac here, um, what do we do? Um, so I explored some of the Mac uh, functionality for, for getting CPU feedback. I kind of didn't like it. So I came up with my own idea. Um, so what I'm going to do uh, oh yeah, this uh, yeah you can write like Jobs Framework lets you write your own plugins for this situation. It has a um, job. Oops, sorry. It has a job uh, sampler behavior which you can implement. We'll talk about it in just a second. Um, so yeah, so this is uh, this is the um, sampler I came up to have um, CPU feedback on my Mac. So I'm gonna. <laughs> Uh, turn off all the fans uh, on my expensive MacBook Pro, and I'm going to attach a temperature sensor to it. And um, based on how the high the temperature goes, um, I'll assume that this is the usage of, of, this, of my CPU. You think it's funny? <laughs> um, well, this is how we do it. We create a module called my thermal sampler, and it's going to implement jobs behavior. All we need is these four methods. And then we replace the jobs uh, sampler CPU with our, with our module name. And that's it. Now, on my Mac, I'll get the uh, CPU feedback from my own uh, temp from this temperature sensor. Um, next, let's see what else we can come up with. What if we get... Um, Post request of varying uh, size. Let's say we decided uh, our audio. Let's say we decided to have our audio configurations come with audio files, like some pre uh, some real recordings rather than text. So this might be anything from "Hi, my name is Jim" to uh, some the whole company directory with address and hours of operations and blah blah blah. So those will be, let's say, in WAV file format, and those get pretty large. So we can really get requests of uh, unpredictable size. Uh, so how do we, now we are back to our memory problem. Remember we had a memory problem with that inflating queue. Um, so how do we do, what do we do about this? Um, so for that one, we can probably create our own queue implementation. Let's call it memory friendly queue. And what the memory friendly queue is going to do, it's going to have max size and bytes instead of uh, number of entries, so that way we can sort of differ, like, so that way we'll be actually accounting for how huge the request is rather than how many requests are in the queue. And the other thing I think would be very nice to do, uh, if you are, if you want to be really nice to our clients, instead of uh, denying their request, we could actually, um, once the max size is reached, we could swap their requests out to disk instead of just dropping them on the floor. So to to have this kind of behavior, we need to implement our own queue, obviously. And this is, <coughs> this is um, how we're going to do it. We're going to implement job queue behavior. And for that, we need to implement seven methods, a little more. 
And then uh, this is a mo this is interesting. When we uh, um, configure our Q, our HTTP request Q in the jobs uh, uh, for jobs, we have to add this new parameter uh, mod, which is the module that the Q implementation points to. So before we didn't specify this parameter because we use the default, which is jobs Q. That's the default that uh, jobs work, uh, uses. But now we need to replace it with our own implementation. And the max size is going to be now in bytes instead of uh, number of entries. And another thing you probably need to uh, consider doing for this problem is uh, maybe uh, implement our own memory sampler. Let's call it free RAM sampler. <laughs> so that sampler is going to get a feedback, memory feedback, so we know what's going on with our uh, with memory on our uh, machine. To do that, we can use again OSMAN mem sub process. Um, and this is this is going to be our code. We're going to create a module called free RAM sampler. It's going to implement implement job sampler behavior, and I'm going to just touch up on the sample, uh, the sample methods, how we're going to implement it. We're going to call NAMSAP get system memory data. And uh, for those of you here who are not Erlang programmers, this thing here, this is, pre this is how um, get system memory data, that's, this is the structure of uh, the result that uh, get system memory data returns. And we just, assign, and we just need free mem out of it. So this is called pattern matching. Not the topic of my conversation, but I just wanted to mention it. Uh, so we get free mem out of this whole uh, big data structure. It's a, it's a list. Um, and we'll use that free mem to compute the load factor. Um, next. So we can adjust uh, Qmax size. That's a really cool idea. So we're going to actually now take the sampler, take our um, take our um, custom queue, and we'll adjust its max size based on what the sampler uh, is giving us. Um, so for this uh, functional, actually, uh, all my jobs uh, uh, notes I sent to Ulf uh, to verify that um, my presentation is uh, correct and, and it's accurate. And I sent this to Ulf, and uh, I was pretty sure that this is possible to do. Uh, and um, Ulf, instead of uh, responding back to me saying that my uh, presentation actually isn't accurate, he just went in and added this functionality. So <laughs> I'm actually very proud we have this kind of functionality in Jobs Framework as of yesterday. I think it was merged with the master branch today, this morning. Thank you very much, Ulf. Um, so now we can modify our Q, uh, Q max size on the fly. Um, now we are really getting kind of far into the jobs framework capabilities. Now my question was, how do we adjust Q max size on the fly based on the info from our freedom sampler? Um, here's the answer how we do this. We have to add, ask Ulf to add this functionality to job server. Uh, we have another choice. We can help expand the jobs functionality ourselves and help uh, Erlang community and uh, expand the existing Erlang libraries. And the, uh, there is actually a third choice. If you need it today, we can use this backdoor. So we can call a job sampler subscribe method in our own process. This is actually how we can do it. There is a way to do it. Jobs framework is very pos uh, powerful. You can do anything in it. It's just not everything is that e like just some behavior might be harder than other, like harder than other to implement. So now your whatever process, your gen server, your FSM, whatever gets uh, feedback in its mailbox, and we can do whatever you want with this feedback. But what we are going to do is we're going to modify memory friendly queue max size based on the received sampler feedback with this new code that Ulf just added yesterday while I was at Geoffrey Belay. And um, yeah, we're going to calculate this new Q size, and it's going to be fluctuating uh, on, on the uh, uh, dynamically. I think, it's a, I think this library is pretty cool. 
you can think about all these crazy situations that can happen in your um, uh, that can happen in your production environment, and uh, you can think of many different overload scenarios, and you can totally control them with this uh, framework. Um, so I, I think it's pretty cool. Um, so now I am before letting you ask me questions. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions myself. They are very simple, true or false questions. Uh, so question one: uh, spawning, uh, true or false? Spawning uh, processes in Erlang is very cheap. Spawn all you want. Is it true or false? True. Good job. Uh, next question: um, Do not worry a bit what kind of work these processes are doing. Erlang VM will make sure everything just works. Awesome. Um, next. Load regulation is a really trivial kind of thing. Um, so just consider writing your own library to uh, implement it. <laughs> <laughs> there are some real, there are some seasoned Erlang developers here. <laughs> I don't disagree, but it is false. <laughs> and final question before you can go to lunch or ask me questions. Um, we should write CPU intensive uh, computations in C and let Erlang manage concurrent execution. False. False? Yeah, use Julia. <laughs> use what? Julia instead of C. Julia. Julia. Oh. C's, C's slow. <laughs> uh, I'll fix my presentation. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry, it says true, but it's false. And uh, now questions uh, I'll try to answer or Google. <laughs> So how do you tell your users when your system is overloaded that you're no longer accepting requests from them? Um, actually, I showed you some examples, so I was going to make sure that that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. I will actually, I didn't get as far as like figuring out how am I going to never let requests uh, drop on the floor, but um, basically with the audio conversions, um, I would just say update unavailable. And I actually do it in many cases, other than uh, when my system doesn't have uh, resources. I actually do it also if they send like a few requests. They're going to bounce off the FSM that's already there. And I'm just going to say, update unavailable. And that's OK. I think user is better off with update unavailable than sitting there waiting uh, for whatever or nothing ever. Are you, now that you have this really good and well thought out load regulation system, are you looking at dynamically spinning up other nodes or instances and um, sharing the requests? So that if you're starting to notice, you know, the volume is coming up, then you actually can now... Oh, yeah, this is... Uh, uh, that's right. actually... I didn't really have... I didn't feel like I have time to go into that. Obviously, you'll have a probably better, uh, like a better load... Like, you'll have some kind of a commercial load balancer in front of your uh, HTTP... Uh, actually HTTP uh, servers. Mm -hmm. But if you wanted to like, actually do something about it yourself, if you have a pretty simple situation, those um, uh, back where I was talking about uh, load feedback from uh, local plus remote nodes, that's what I think was, I didn't go into details mm -hmm. on that, but this would be kind of cool. That's where, that's where you could actually implement your own load balancer right. by getting the, there is Java framework lets you configure it pretty easily. Uh, so you could get feedback, and you'll know, like, this one's, this node's not as busy, let's send it over there. It's very easy to do with uh, Erlang. It's just writing, like, you'll write this code to do it in, like, half an hour to actually send your, uh, send your requests elsewhere instead of just one node. Right, because you, you, can, you can imagine, I think, problem domains, and yours m might be one of them, where the, the initial load balancer only really knows the size of the request, but some requests might be two orders of magnitude worse on the CPU than others. So you could almost like hook up this to the front end load balancer at some... Yeah, and point. actually yeah. The, the thing is that I kind of just kind of scratched the surface of what you can do here. And I think it would be a really fun exercise at home except for the uh, except for that uh, temperature sensor. <laughs> Everything else I would strongly recommend you try at home and play with it. 
it's actually very easy to play with these things in um, Erlang. You can actually st you can actually start jobs uh, <coughs> application from your command line. Just application start jobs, and it just do whatever, and you can start some some crazy tests and see what it can do. And it would be really fun. You could probably run your tests on like multiple nodes on the same machine. And you also have a problem of your CPUs, CPUs starving from you running those on the same machine. And that's where those samplers will help you regulate it because they'll actually give you the idea of what the actual CPU is uh, on the entire, like CPU situation on the entire machine. So you just, you can like play with whatever scenarios. Um, I don't think it answered your question, but no, no. <laughs> encourage you to answer it yourself at home. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Uh, have you implemented any caching mechanism in Erlang for your CPU intensive processes? Um, depends on what kind of level of caching. Like you, you can use a uh, table. I hope like nobody here with guns to shoot me for saying things that I shouldn't be saying. Or you can use Mnesia. I think, I don't know how good Mnesia is for caching, but Mnesia is a built-in Erlang database and it's one of, the, like it's probably like the second fastest way to get things cached. Um, or you can cache uh, things in your state. That's gonna be a pretty huge state, you don't wanna do that. Um, yeah. If I'm gonna keep talking, I'm gonna get shot. <laughs> I, honestly, I'm a, a bit of an Erlang newbie, so some of the questions I answer might not be quite accurate, so. Um, yeah. Uh, yes? So in the beginning of the talk, uh, you said that uh, your laptop has uh, eight cores, so that, that is why you limit to seven jobs. And uh, how uh, you can make uh, sure that each job hit a certain core? Is it possible that all the seven jobs go to a single core? Not no, uh, uh, that's the, the thing is that Erlang, like when I spawn multiple processes, Erlang is going to make sure that Erlang actually takes care of this part. That's if I, if I spawn thousands of processes or hundreds, Erlang will actually make sure that the uh, processes are distributed, uh, like are taken up all these underlying CPU cores. The only, need I, I, the only thing I need to control is that when I have CPU intensive work, I need to make sure that I don't have hundreds of them. I can't start hundreds of those because then they will be running all right. It's just. Uh, we, like we, we need to deprioritize them so that other important work can get through. But uh, to answer your question, Erlang VM is going to take care of that. As far as I understood, uh, you're, you move your intensive job into C code. So if you spawn, uh, uh, say, seven, seven threads in C, it's no, you don't. You don't. You don't. That's the whole thing. Uh, sorry if I didn't make it clear enough. You create tiny. Uh, Tiny units of execution, they're single threaded. That's <coughs> important. They're, they should be single threaded. And then you let Erlang uh, run them simultaneously. So just those units of C computation should be pretty simple. It's only for those um, computations that need uh, some large data structures to be manipulated because Erlang is, has uh, immutable data structures, so they'll, be, they'll keep being copied and that's going to make things slower and less efficient. So that's the only situation when you need to consider writing it in C, and there, are, it's it's very well supported uh, in Erlang. But there is no way you should be writing those in multi-threaded fashion in C. Just a single-threaded unit of work and let Erlang manage uh, manage the concurrency. Uh, do you provide a service for different customers, or one for one for each server? Oh, no, we, our server is uh, for many different customers. Oh, so, how do you uh, handle the fairness between customers? So, like, because you have a, one single queue and it can be taken by one big customer with a huge request and uh, other customers will not be served. Um, first of all, we will adjust the number of servers we are running this thing on, depending on how many customers we have. We're just going to start our server on as many servers as we need to make sure that there are enough resources. But we have, we actually have a pretty, uh, uh, we, we do have a re reasonable uh, estimate of how big the requests are going to be. These are audio greetings. These are not, I would say, uh, we don't have, we don't host some kind of file sharing uh, 
size or something. We actually know as they might be of varying size, but you know they they can only get that large, I guess. And um, there's going to be some kind of average, and we will we, we know how many customers we have, and we will just make sure there are enough servers running to. No, I mean just uh, like if you limit the queue for some value, mm -hmm. uh, can one customer take all the queue and uh, prevent all others from taking service? Um, the thing is that hopefully, actually, queue is for a situation of overload. Just we actually hoping that our we have enough machines and enough resources to not get anything in the queue. Yeah, but the question is like your owner say that uh, all your customers are operating uh, correctly, and one uh, one is just uh, exp or experiencing an overload. Mm -hmm. So will it affect others? Uh, well, if we have an overload. So it's all about fairness, yeah. Uh, uh, fairness is something that I didn't demonstrate in this presentation. And this is something you might consider, like you just consider uh, how do we build in fairness into this whole thing. It's just, uh, it's probably going to be a pretty long answer or... It, it just needs to. Just a question: Do, do you uh, use some fairness? The thing is that there is no built-in fairness. I think load balancer is good enough. Our requests are not that huge. We don't get that many of them right now. And uh, basically, this whole task framework was to prevent overload and make sure that our server doesn't blow up when things like you are describing actually happen. Uh, so we're just trying to make sure that things just don't explode on us, right? So when this huge request actually gets processed or gets through, things are just going to get right back to normal. Hope that makes sense. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much.